So we've got the Ural Mountains running there. Everything to the west of it is European Russia. Everything to the east of it is Asian Russia. And those, <coughs> there's lots of regions. We typically think of the whole of that region as being Siberia. And these dots, these red dots, represent not camps, but camp complexes. Some of these are tens, some of them are hundreds of camps, so there's thousands of them all over the place. And that's why um, Solzhenitsyn wrote a book that was known called the Gulag Archipelago, because there was lots of these, like little islands all over the place. Um, and at any one time, there was up to three and a half million people in these Gulags, not just Poles and other people that were deported, but their own people were also deported. And there are estimates that over 20 million people actually lost their lives in these, uh, these uh, gulags. And my dad was actually sent to possibly the worst place. It was this area here called Kolima, or Koima in Polish. Um, now to you and me, it didn't mean anything. But if you said it to a Russian, or a Pole, or people that knew, Kolima was actually a death sentence. It was a place where people didn't want to go. It's where they sent the career criminals. It was such a bad place. It's actually 11 time zones across from Poland to get it. And that's where my dad was sent. So he started over here in his village. He actually spent some time in the prison at Vinaika. And he was sent right across Russia and Siberia. And they're going to say in cattle trucks, but if I said a cattle truck, that's not, not giving you the impression of what it is. I mean, I'm not going to be graphic in anything I say in this talk at all, but there are some really upsetting and harrowing things that go on. But these, these cattle trucks were, well, I don't know really how to describe them. They, they crammed 60 or 80 people in with no heating, no water, no, no, um, uh, no sanitation, no air or anything. It was awful. Uh, really, really bad conditions, and they travelled in them to their to, the, to their places of where they're going to to the particular camp that they were going to. And as I said, there was camps all over. But my dad was going to this area. The big town of Magadan was actually built to accommodate the arrival of um, people going to these camps in this region. There was actually no road to it. The only way you could get there was by sea or by air. They, they started to build the road known as the Road of Bones, um, but it was only passable at the worst times of the year when the rivers were frozen and things like that. Um, and, and when we talk about Siberia, it, you know, it, it sort of gives us the idea of this place of horrible misery and everything. But Siberia is a beautiful place. I mean, it's, it's incredible, really. It's, it's got lots of flora and fauna, and what it's particularly got is lots of natural resources. It's got things like coal, gold, uranium, wood, and all sorts of minerals. The problem was, though, that the Russians didn't have the resources to actually um, facilitate the extraction of those things. And that's why they actually exiled these groups of people to these areas to help in the um, extraction of, of these facilities. But it is cold very cold. And in fact, where, where my dad was sent into that region of Kolyma, <coughs> it is so remote that even to this day, they refer to the rest of Russia as the mainland, even though they're connected to, to Russia. It's so isolated. Um, and there were various types of camps. Um, some, some people were sent to work in factories, others worked on, on, on the construction of roads and railways, the road of bones being one example. It, it tried to get all the way to Magadan, and it was actually, they reckon that for every metre of that road, there was at least one prisoner had died and was actually incarcerated into the road. And the road is over 2,000 kilometres long, and if you calculate that, that's about 2,000 people that were actually incorporated into the road, so absolutely disgusting, horrible. Anyway, others worked in forests and factories and farms, and then there was others that were doing hard labour, like my dad, and he was sent to Kolyma to work in the gold mines. And we know that of the Poles that were exiled around that time, there was about two and a half million Poles from 1940 and 1941 exiled to Siberia. Of those two, and it's an estimate, 
it's a bad estimate, it could be a lot more. Of those poles, we know that at least 20,000 were sent to Colima, like my dad. And we have records of only 580 of them ever getting back. So I, my dad was incredibly lucky, and I'm incredibly lucky. So where he was, went to, as we've said, it's actually the benchmark of coal. This is a typical winter temperature, 45.7 below freezing. And this is the hotel in the town of Omiyakon. And this is in the next valley to where my dad uh, was sent to, to work. Anybody want to hazard a guess uh, of the coldest temperature? It's actually the coldest occupied town in the Northern Hemisphere, permanently occupied town, Omiyakon. Any ideas of the, the, the coldest it's ever been recorded there? Minus 65. A good guess. Anybody else? One more, one more guess, go on. 70. Very good. Minus 71. Incredible. But it didn't matter for those people. They had to work. Now, these weren't camps like we know of in, in, in Germany where they, they were taken to, to, to be killed. These were camps where they were taken and had to work. If they worked, they were given an allowance. Not a very big allowance of food, but an allowance. And they were given uh, targets to make, known as norms. If they made their norm, they were given a food allowance. If they didn't make their norm, they were given a proportion of it. If they did nothing, they got nothing. So it basically, if you want to live, you have to work. So it's a work to live routine. The food was, well, I, I call it food. It's, it's, it's an overstatement. Um, often it was just fish entrails. Often the bread would be topped up with sawdust and things like that. It was terrible. Anyway, while my dad was out in Colima, the war was going on elsewhere, and Russia had invaded Finland, and by 1940 the Germans had captured the Low Countries and France and actually attacked England in the Battle of Britain. As I mentioned before, those in France escaped to England where the government in exile set up in London. Uh, and of the soldiers that moved there, they formed what was known as the Polish First Army Corps. And they eventually would fight at Narvik and Normandy. Um, and we also had the Polish Air Force, which significantly fought in the Battle of Britain as well. But Hitler eventually gave up on attacking England. And on the 22nd of June 1941, he moved to attack Russia. So they had an alliance before the war. Uh, there was a non-aggression pact between Poland, uh, sorry, between Germany and Russia. But in 1941, Germany moved on into Russia, and even by the first day, the Germans had managed to get to my dad's village. I mentioned that my dad had got two brothers. They were eventually captured by the Germans and sent to be forced labour in, in in Germany, and they both ended up in Dachau, uh, and both survived, fortunately. Um, but there were some appalling atrocities that happened even in my dad's, the nearest town, Kabilnik, where, where he'd been a tailor. In Russia, Stalin panicked because the Germans advanced very quickly in the north to, to what was that, then Leningrad, in the center to, towards Moscow, and in the south, Stalingrad. And Stalin was desperate for help. He'd ask anybody for help. And what he decided to do was release those Poles that had been exiled to Siberia in what was known as an amnesty. Now, amnesty is, a, well, it's an invidious word, really, because it sort of suggests that they were being forgiven for something that they'd done wrong, and clearly they'd done nothing wrong, so amnesty isn't the right word. It's, uh, it's, it causes a lot of offence in the Polish circles. So these Poles were released from the camp, and this is General Tchaikovsky with Antony and Churchill, and the, uh, the Russian ambassador to London, a guy called Ivan Maisky, discussing the fact that they were going to allow the Poles, once they would have been released from these gulags, to form a Polish army on Russian territory to help fight the Russians with the German attacks. The problem was they couldn't find many officers. We know that they've been segregated into special camps, but one officer they had in solitary confinement in the Lubyanka in Moscow was this guy, General Wadislav Anders. Um, he was the most senior officer and he was given the task on release to form 
what was known as the Polish army in the Soviet Union. So, and this was in, uh, in the um, August and December of 1941. And he was given an old Russian army base at a place called Buzhaluk uh, on the Volga River, about a thousand kilometers southeast of Moscow. And he was allowed to form the headquarters at Buzhaluk and two infantry divisions, one at Tokoyi and one at Tatyshevo. So all the Poles that were being released and were suitable for army would make their way here um, to Buzhaluk. Um, and they, their offices or their headquarters was in the uh, central uh, government office in, in Buzhaluk, which, which is still there. Um, and when this was taken, there were actually commemorative plaques to the Polish army, but those have since been removed since the uh, invasion of Ukraine. But all these people that were released from these camps all across the Soviet Union started to, to arrive and they were in pitiful condition. Some of them didn't even have shoes or anything. Um, and to assist with the uh, collection of these poles, uh, the army set up collection centres and local offices where they would offer some assistance and directions uh, to try and find Bujaluk, but they had to find their own way there. And once they got there, those that could enlisted into to the Polish army in the Soviet Union. Uh, but there were lots of those that couldn't, lots of civilians, older people, women and children, and the ill also turned up. But that winter of 1941 was incredibly cold. The Russians provided very limited clothing, and they had to make do the Poles. 